Welcome to Love and Money Secrets TV. I'm Dame Lillian Walker, your host, and today we are starting a brand new book, and it is called Breaking the Habit of Becoming Yourself. It's by Dr. Joe Dispenza. So let's get started. I'm so excited to share this information with you. So your brain is evolved and involved in everything you do, including how you think, how you feel, how you act, and how well you get along with other people. It's the organ of personality, character, intelligence, and every decision you make. From my brain imaging work with tens of thousands of patients worldwide over the past 20 years, it is very clear to me that when your brain works right, you work right. And when your brain is troubled, you are much more likely to have trouble in your life. With a healthier brain, you are happier, physically healthier, wealthier, wiser, and just make better decisions, which helps you become more successful and live longer. When the brain is not healthy for whatever reason, such as a head injury or past emotional trauma, people are sadder sicker, poorer, less wise, and less successful. It's easy to understand how trauma can hurt the brain, but researchers have also been seeing how negative thinking and bad programming from our past can also affect it. So for example, I grew up with an older brother who was intent on shoving me around. The constant tension and fear I felt then led to a higher level of anxiety, anxious thinking patterns, and always being on guard never knowing when something bad was about to happen. This fear caused long-term overactivity in my brain's fear centers until I was able to work through it later in life. In Breaking the Habit of Being Yourself, my colleague, Dr. Joe Dispenza, is your guide to optimize both the hardware and software of your brain to help you reach a new state of mind. His new book is based on solid science, and he continues to speak with kindness and wisdom as he did in the award-winning film, What the Bleep Do We Know? And in his first book, Evolve Your Brain. Even though I think of the brain like a computer with both hardware and software, the hardware, the actual physical function of the brain, is not separate from the software or the constant programming and reshaping that occurs throughout our lives. They have a dramatic impact on each other. Most of us have, have had some sort of trauma of some kind in our lives and live with the day-to-day -day scars that have resulted. Cleaning out those experiences that have become part of the brain's structure can be incredibly healing. So of course, engaging in brain healthy habits, such as proper diet and exercise and certain brain nutrients is critical to the brain working right. But in addition, your moment by moment thoughts exert a powerful healing effect on the brain, or they can work to your detriment. The same is true for past experiences that become wired in the brain. So the study we do at the Amen clinics is called Brain SPECT Imaging. SPECT, single photon emission, computed tomography, is a nuclear medicine study that looks at blood flow and activity patterns. It is different from CT scans or MRI, which examine the brain's anatomy because SPECT looks at how the brain functions. Our SPECT work, now over 70,000 scans, has taught us so many important life lessons about the brain, such as brain injuries can ruin people's lives. Alcohol is not a health food and often shows significant damage on spec scans. A number of medications people routinely take, such as common anti-anxiety medications, are not good for the brain. And diseases like Alzheimer's actually start in the brain decades before people have any symptoms. SPECT scans have also taught us that as a society, we need to have much more love and respect for the brain, and that allowing children to play contact sports like football and hockey is not a smart idea. One of the most exciting lessons I have learned is that people can literally change their brains and change their lives by engaging in regular brain healthy habits, such as correcting negative beliefs, and using meditative processes, such as those discussed by Dr. Dispenza. In one series of studies, we published the practice of meditation, such as what Dr. Dispenza recommends, boosted blood flow to the prefrontal cortex, the most thoughtful part 
of the human brain. After eight weeks of daily meditation, the prefrontal cortex at rest was stronger and the memories of our subjects were better too. There are so many ways to heal and optimize the brain. My hope is that like me, you will develop brain envy and want a better functioning brain. The brain imaging work we do has changed everything in my own life. Shortly after I started ordering spec scans in 1991, I decided to look at my own brain. I was 37 years old. When I saw the toxic, bumpy appearance, I knew it was not healthy. All of my life, I have been someone who rarely drank alcohol, never smoked, and never used an illegal drug. Then why did my brain look so bad? Okay, I'm gonna pause right here because if this is, think about it. This is Dr. Daniel Amen. And Dr. Daniel Amen, as if you don't know who Dr. Daniel Amen is, I encourage you to look him up on Google and on YouTube. He's done countless PBS specials, worldwide known neuroscientist and brain expert. And he is, he has incredible, an incredible body of work, especially dealing with NFL football players who 100% of NFL football players, by the way, have basically brain damage. They have all have TBIs to some greater, some lesser, but all of them have TBIs. And a lot of them have aberrant behavior and a lot of different health problems. And it's because of those TBIs because they don't have healthy brain. So, oh, it looks like we've got somebody who's wanting to join our Zoom. Paulette, welcome to Love and Money Secrets TV. We are just talking about Daniel Amen here as we're talking about the book, Breaking the Habit of Becoming Yourself. Uh, how are you doing tonight? Wonderful, thank you. Wonderful, wonderful. Okay, so I'm gonna put you on mute and we're gonna keep on talking and, um, and then we're gonna open this up for discussion, okay? Thank you. All right, so as I was saying, he has an incredible body of work working with NF the NFL and it's incredible. There's a tremendous number of those players who have been officially diagnosed prior to them even working with Dr. Daniel Amen as having different degrees of brain damage. And most of conventional medicine was saying that, you know, once you have brain damage, it's not reversible and it was a permanent thing. However, because of the strategies in the application of um, certain systems, if you will, that Dr. Dan Daniel Amen has, which includes basically nutrition, no sugar, different nutritional supplements that will encourage the neurological pathways of the brain to grow and to regrow and for neurons to reform and to re-express themselves. Now, I can speak from two fronts. I have been a fan of Dr. Daniel Amen for years and never did I ever think myself that I was going to actually need his services. And then as some of you know, if you followed and read with me, the Becoming Supernatural book, chapters one through 14 and the afterward, you'll know that I've spoken about the traumatic brain injury, the accident that I had in 2017, when I was hit while I was riding my bike, I was hit by an Orange County Transit Authority bus. I went flying, had traumatic brain injury, neck injury, lower back injury, also, you know, um, injured my right leg, have, still have a scar, you know, from that and multiple things that have happened. You know, I'm not 100% healed from that either. I'm still doing the meditation, still trying to heal myself 100%, but I'm considerably better, considerably better than I was before. And not only did I have the opportunity to work with Daniel Amen as a patient, but I also worked on a film called Quiet Explosions where Emmy award-winning producer and writer Jerry Schur did this film. I was part of the crew where we produced and we shot this and we had Dr. Daniel Amen as one of the experts that came on to talk about the quiet explosions that occur in the brain and how oftentimes people, you know, whether they're football players, whether they're vets who have suffered traumatic brain injuries, you know, on combat field or people who have suffered brain injuries and unbeknownst to them they're they're walking around with tbis and have certain behaviors that they think are now normal to them because they've grown so accustomed to them but some of these injuries were from when they were in high school and when they played football or when they were in high school and got hit in the head by a baseball or soccer the multiple repeatedly banging on the you know front part of their head or the side of the head 
And that rattling sensation where your brain is, you know, you have shaken brain syndrome that occurs from that. He is a wonderful advocate about that. I can speak from firsthand experience as not only, you know, a reader of his books and as a fan of his work and the incredible strides that he's made, but also as a patient and also as being, you know, as part of principal photography and production of the movie Quiet Explosions, which you guys have to watch that when it premieres. We were supposed to premiere in March and of course the quarantine hit and so the governor said no gatherings and we had to postpone that premiere. Who knows when we'll be premiering that film. But I'll be sure to let you know once it is, once we do have the film premiere. But it has to do with the quiet, quiet explosions of the brain that people are walking around with. Basically you're like a walking time bomb. And some people have fits of anger and rage and they don't understand, they don't know Maybe they didn't used to be that way, but maybe ever since they were a teenager or ever since they were in their 20s, from that point forward, they started to develop this impulse, lack of control, weight problems, depression, bipolar symptoms, a whole myriad of things. The bottom line is that here we have Dr. Daniel Amen, who hasn't been somebody who has abused alcohol, never smoked, and never used an illegal drug, and his brain looked bad. So can you imagine, for those of us who socially drink a drink here or there, for those of us, I never smoked. Um, I don't do illegal drugs of any sort. I don't even take over-the-counter drugs. I don't even take Tylenol or Advil or acetaminophen or I, even, even with this accident, I used meditation. I tried to the best of my ability to use the meditation because I knew that meditation for pain control works. So here's somebody who didn't abuse their brain, didn't load a lot of sugar into it, didn't load a lot of alcohol. Another thing, a lot of, a lot of you may not know this. I have a strong background in, I was pre-med biological sciences at USC and I actually have a lineage behind me of over a thousand years of hospitalers who were the original people who basically opened up hospitals so that the common person, first of all, first it was for children and then it was for the common person so that not, not just nobility would have access to health care, but so that the common person would actually have health care available to them. And so that being said, one of the things that I remember, I'll never forget in organic chemistry when we learned that alcohol basically turns into sugar in the body as it metabolizes. And if you see, if you look at the chemical formula, you'll see how actually how the structure of the molecules actually turn into sugar. Another thing that people don't think about, because you have to pay attention to your sugar intake because sugar increases the acidity in your body, your brain bathed in acid doesn't do very well. You know, it does better with proteins and there's certain types of proteins, of course, that are better than others. So the, my point being is that here is somebody who didn't abuse alcohol, didn't abuse drugs, didn't, didn't smoke, and yet he, he had his brain didn't look good. If you have been smoking most of your life, if you make no mistakes, if you smoke weed, don't fool yourself and say, oh, I don't smoke. All I do, all I smoke is weed, you know, marijuana, pot, uh, that's smoking. And there's even commercials now I know that are out where, you know, people say, oh no, I don't smoke. And it's like, oh, I only, I only smoke weed. And then of course the, the guy in the commercial is like, oh no, I don't, I don't like girls who, who smoke. And I'm like, but I don't smoke. I just, I do weed. It's like, it's smoking, make no mistakes. The bottom line is that if you, are a frequent drinker of alcohol. Alcohol turns into, into sugar in your body, which is not good. It creates an acidic environment. Rice, pasta, a lot of carbs turn into sugar. You can offset that if you know how to combine, do a certain amount of food combining, you can offset that and alkalize your body, which when you do meditation, when you do deep breathing exercises, and even, even without meditation, deep breathing exercises alkalize the body. So there are things that you can do to offset that so you can still have, like me, you can't take away pasta and rice for me. I'm Spanish and Italian, hello. You know, we have rice or pasta every single day. We, have, we also have a lot of green leafy vegetables, yada, yada, yada. Let's find out why his brain looks so bad. And this is interesting because now he's, looking at himself as not only the neurologist, but also as the patient. Before I really understood about brain health, I had many bad brain habits. I ate lots of fast food. I've never been a big fast food fan, but 
there was a period in my life that I had my share of happy meals, I will confess. So he had a lot of fast food. Drank diet soda, another pause. There's a clue in diet soda why you should not be drinking diet soda. And I've always said, don't eat anything that's sugar-free, fat-free, okay, sugar-free, fat-free, or diet. First of all, the word die is in diet. You drop the T and it's die. Why would I drink a drink that's inferring death? No, I can go off on some chemistry aspects about diet foods that are allegedly diet foods, low fat, fat-free, sugar-free, etc. Everybody I know who eats that group of foods all have weight problems. I have never eaten any of those foods and have never had a weight problem. And then of course people will probably say, oh, it's genetics. I don't think it's just genetics. I think that genetics has a part in that uh, realm, but I think also what you eat, how you eat, when you eat, makes a big difference and that's what he will disclose in just a few minutes here. So he talks about how I ate lots of fast food, drank diet soda like she was my best friend. I've known people who replaced diet soda. They drink that instead of water because they don't like water and then 20 years after drinking diet soda they start to have kidney problems of course. He said often slept only four to five hours a night and carried unexamined hurts from the past. Okay, preaching to the choir here because I've been infamous for pulling all-nighters when I was in college and throughout my career. And it wasn't until I was, I think, in my early 40s when I started realizing this, even though it's not difficult for me to do, it's probably not the healthiest thing to do. And the reality is that there was a study that was conducted that was highlighted by a show called 2020. where they showed side by side people who had been sleep deprived next to people who had had two or three drinks. And they put them both behind the wheel of a car and put them on the exact same obstacle course where they had to drive kind of making S's around pylons on the asphalt in a, in a very large parking lot. And would you believe that the drunks did better than the sleep deprived people? Yes, my friends. So when I saw that, I was about four years old and I was horrified. I was aghast to see that the people who were sleep deprived, who I've always prided myself in saying, you know, I don't get drunk. Why? Because I usually don't have more than one or two drinks when I drink. I usually, and then it takes me hours to finish one drink. So I'm a sipper. I don't like drinking, drinking. I like, if I'm out with friends and stuff, I like sipping on whatever the drink is, whether it's wine, champagne, a mojito, whatever the case might be, I like sipping it. Well, <laughs> turns out the drunks in this test, and there was a lot of conclusive evidence from other universities apparently, and these were all college age students. So they were all students, I think they were juniors and seniors that were in college, and one control group was sleep deprived for two nights, three nights in a row, and the other group had had, um, I think, three to four drinks, and they were men and women. They slept only four to five hours a night and carried unexamined hurts from the past. I think we're all guilty of that. Heck, for a long time, for a long time I didn't have any hurts from the past, and then I did, and then of course I carried them with me, and then I had to figure out how to let them go and forgive and so on and so forth. Then he goes on to say, I didn't exercise, felt chronically stressed, and carried an extra 30 pounds. Wow, what I didn't know was hurting me and not just a little. So I wonder how many of you right now, what a coincidence that you happen to be watching this video at this very point in time. Maybe one, two, three, all or a few of these are things that you yourself are doing. This might be your wake up call to say, hey, you know, carrying that extra 10, 20, 30 pounds, feeling chronically stressed, albeit right now with everything that's going on in our world, a lot of people are feeling very stressed. And then, believe it or not, there's a lot of people, there's a lot of us who aren't feeling stressed right now, especially if we, if it's part of this community who's really been 
diving deep into meditation and prayer and mindful practices. He says here, my last scan looks healthier and much younger than it did 20 years earlier. My brain has literally aged backwards. That's how changeable your brain is too. When you make up your mind to take care of it properly, after seeing my original scan, I wanted my brain to be better. This book will help yours be better too. I hope you enjoy reading it as much as I did. Daniel G. Amen, MD, author of Change Your Brain, Change Your Life. Okay, so we're gonna get started here with chapter, actually the introduction, and then we'll get into chapter one. Introduction, the greatest habit you can ever break is the habit of being yourself. When I think about all the books on creating the life we desire, I realize how many of us are still looking for approaches that are grounded in sound scientific evidence methods that truly work, but already new research into the brain and body, the mind and consciousness, and a quantum leap in our understanding of physics is suggesting expanded possibilities on how to move toward what we innately know is our real potential. As a practicing chiropractor who runs a busy integrated health clinic, and as an educator in the fields of neuroscience, brain function, biology, and brain chemistry, I have been privileged to be at the forefront of some of this research, not just by studying the fields mentioned above, but also by observing the effects of this new science once applied by common people like you and me. That's the moment when the possibilities of this new science become reality, also known as realize. So as a consequence, I have witnessed some of the remarkable changes in individuals' health and quality of life when they truly change their minds. So over the last several years, I have had the opportunity to interview a host of people who overcame significant health conditions that were considered either terminal or permanent. Per the contemporary model of medicine, these recoveries were labeled spontaneous remissions. However, upon my extensive examination of their inner journeys, it became apparent to me that there was a strong element of mind involved and their physical changes weren't so spontaneous after all. This discovery furthered my postgraduate studies in brain imaging, neuroplasticity, epigenetics, and psychoimmunology. So I want to call attention to this because I want you to recognize that Dr. Joe Dispenza is not only a chiropractor, but he did further his postgraduate studies and did specializations in brain imaging. No wonder he does all those EEGs at so many of the monasteries when we attend the seven day advanced uh, events. So brain imaging, neuroplasticity, epigenetics, which Dr. Bruce Lipton is not only a friend, but he is also a colleague of Dr. Joe Dispenza's and has, has, has been a guest on my radio show, The Bottom Line Show Live. He is a father of modern day epigenetics. He started doing stem cell cloning in 1967. If you don't know who he is, he is the author of The Biology of Belief. Google, watch his videos. He's recently been very, very vocal about what's going on throughout this entire planet. So it would be a good investment of your time to educate yourself and listen to a few hours of what Dr. Bruce Lipton has to say. Him and Dr. Joe Dispenza share the stage often throughout the world. And so he's the father, he's the one who basically in, invented um, epigenetics. And if you don't know what epigenetics is, uh, right now I'm gonna say Google it, but it's basically letting, it, it's the, he, he proved scientifically that cells are not controlled by the DNA, they're not controlled by the nucleus of the cell, that the cell membrane is not the nucleus, that in fact it is the cell membrane that surrounds the outer layer of the cell as it reacts with the environment, that's what controls the expression of that cell, which was a game changer. Psychoneuroimmunology. So I simply figured that something had to be happening in the brain and body that could be zeroed in on and then replicated. In this book, I want to share some of what I learned along the way and show you by exploring how mind and matter are interrelated and how you can apply these principles, not only to your body, but to any aspect of your life. Boy, ain't that the truth. So going beyond knowing to knowing how. So many readers of my first book, Evolve Your Brain, The Science of Changing Your Mind, 
voiced the same honest and heartfelt request, along with a fair amount of positive feedback, such as the person who wrote, quote, I really liked your book. I read it twice. It had lots of science and was very thorough and inspiring. But can you tell me how to do it? How do I evolve my brain? I think that's a great question. And I think that is at the heart of what most people care about. You know, if something works, okay, great that you're telling me that it works, but let's move on to exactly what did you do that I can duplicate so that I can potentially receive the same results. Doesn't that make sense? So in response, I began teaching a workshop series on the practical steps anyone can take to make changes at the level of the mind and the body that will lead to lasting results. Consequently, I have seen people experience unexplainable healings, release old mental and emotional wounds, resolve so-called impossible difficulties, create new opportunities, and experience wonderful health. Just to name a few, you will meet some of those people in these pages, and it's not necessary that you read my first book to digest the material in this one. But if you have been exposed to my work, I wrote breaking the habit of being yourself to serve as a practical how-to companion to evolve your brain. It is my earnest objective to make this new book simple and easy to understand. There will be times though that I will have to give you bits of knowledge to act as the forerunner to a concept I want to develop. The purpose is to build a realistic working model of personal transformation that will help you understand how we can change. So breaking the habit of being yourself is a product of one of my passions, a sincere effort to demystify the mystical so that every person understands that we have within our reach all we need to make significant changes in our lives. This is a time when not only do we want to know, but we want to know how. How do we apply and personalize both emerging scientific concepts and age-old wisdom to succeed at living a more enriched life? When you and I can connect the dots of what science is discovering about the nature of reality, and when we give ourselves permission to apply those principles in our day-to-day -day experience and existence, then each of us becomes both a mystic and a scientist in our own life. So I invite you to experiment with everything that you learned in this book and to objectively observe the results. What I mean is that if you make the effort to change your inner world of thoughts and feelings, your external environment should begin to give you feedback to show you that your mind has had an effect on the outer world. Why else would you do it? So if you take intellectual information that you learn as a philosophy and then you initiate that knowledge into your life by applying it enough times until you master it you will ultimately move from being a philosopher to an initiate to a master stay tuned there is sound scientific evidence that this is possible I do ask you up front to keep an open mind so that we can build, so that we can build step by step the concepts I outline in this book. All of this information is for you to do something with. Otherwise, it's just good dinner conversation, isn't it? Once you can open your mind to the way things really are and let go of your conditioned beliefs with which you are accustomed to framing reality, let us pause here because I want you to pay close attention to the languaging here. As some of you uh, know, I am very big on doing neuro health resets to help link and sync the left and the right hemisphere of the brain to help you relieve from pain. Whether the pain is physical or emotional, spiritual or psychological, makes no difference. Whether you have a belief that it works or not, makes no difference either because it taps into neuroplasticity and the eight different sensory systems of the body. And it's how your body how your brain, the organ, actually categorizes everything that it sees, smells, tastes, hears, touches, and senses. That's why it doesn't matter whether you believe or not. And here he said something critical, which is why I'm, I'm pointing it out. If you're reading in your books at home, whether it's on your Kindle, your iPad, or a physical book, highlight 
Let go of your conditioned beliefs with which you are accustomed to framing reality. Put a circle around framing reality as well as highlighting that phrase. Because make no mistakes, your brain as it categorizes and files information, it's like your brain has like a filing cabinet and it stores by relevance information. Information it's never heard of before, you're firing and wiring 2600 neurological pathways of the brain's neurons are just like going off like crazy like a Christmas tree like little twinkle lights boom 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 if it's something that you've heard before half the neurons and neurological pathways of the brain are enacted so it's half the light half the energy half the electricity is wiring and firing you're actually smarter by listening by reading by learning this information you're actually getting smarter. Not only are you learning things, you're being exposed to new information. You're also being challenged to how you frame reality because scientists have actually proven from a quantum level to a 3D outward experience level, how things actually work and the truth and how by reframing your reality, once you know how things actually work, and you understand it, then with more conviction, with more faith, with more fervor, you go at it because you have an understanding at a deeper level. Does that make sense? So you are now framing, your, your, as we speak, you're reframing your reality. You should see the fruits of your efforts. That is my wish for you. The information in these pages is there to inspire you, to prove to yourself that you are, in fact, a divine creator. We should never wait for science to give us the permission to do the uncommon. If we do, then we are turning science into another religion. We should be brave enough to contemplate our lives, do what we thought was outside of the box, and do it repeatedly. When we do that, we are on our way to a greater level of personal power. True empowerment comes when we start to look deeply at our beliefs. We may find their roots in the conditioning of religion, culture, society, education, family, the media, and even our genes. The latter being imprinted by the sensory experiences of our current lives, as well as untold generations before. When then we weighed those old ideas against some new paradigms that may serve us better. Times are in fact changing. Make no mistakes, we see that going on big time. We've had massive change since the last week of February to this very day. So as individuals awaken to a greater reality, we are part of a much larger sea of change. Our current systems and models of reality are breaking down, they sure are. And it is time for something new to emerge. Across the board, our models for politics, economics, religion, science, education, medicine, and our relationship with the environment are all showing a different landscape than just 10 years ago. Big time pause button. In fact, I should get one of those, you know, staples. You've got those red buttons that you hit it and it says, that was easy. I wish I had one that said pause. I could hit the pause button. I want, you know, stone's throw from where, where I am right now, here in Huntington Beach. We have bioluminescent beaches now, right at sunset. For several hours, we, you know, we've had the red tides, the algae, they're dinoflagellates. The population of dinoflagellates is so high because there's such little pollution and the ocean has been able to breathe and propagate itself and reproduce. And the water's clear that we have a much larger, like probably the biggest red tide I've ever seen in my lifetime. And that gives way to the dinoflagellates glowing at nighttime because they absorb the light during the day because they're biophotonic. And boom, we have these incredible waves. If you don't know what I'm talking about, just go to YouTube and do bioluminescent waves. Huntington Beach, Newport Beach, it's a phenomena that's been taking place for the better part of a month now. And it goes from San Diego all the way to Venice Beach, California. We also have it in the Channel Islands. Oh my gosh, I can't imagine the Channel Islands. It must be spectacular right now. Santa Cruz and, oh my gosh, Santa Rosa. 
That's, that's literally a Virgin Island. That's showing us a, di a very different landscape right now. We're also seeing bluer skies, cleaner air. So that's just two, three pretty obvious things that are going on right, right now as this video is live streaming. So letting go of the outmoded and embracing the new sounds easy, but as I pointed out in Evolve Your Brain, much of what we have learned and experienced has been incorporated into our biological self and we wear it like a garment. But we also know that what is true today might not be true tomorrow. So just as we have come to question our perception of atoms as solid pieces of matter, reality and our interaction with it is a progression of ideas and beliefs. We also know that to leave the familiar life that we have grown accustomed to and waltz into something new is like a salmon <laughs> swimming upstream. It takes effort. It does. It takes effort and frankly, it's uncomfortable. You know what? It's uncomfortable, but not that much. To be honest with you, I gotta say, it's not that uncomfortable. I think for some people, you know, we all have different personality types. Some people are more resistant to change than others. Some people are more easygoing and they go with the flow and others are not. They're not as flexible. You know, um, one of the things that I love about yoga is they, one of the sayings that we have is that a flexible body is a flexible mind. So if you have a rigid body, the likelihood is that you probably also have a rigid mind. I don't know about you, but if you think about it, when we have a storm, the clues are in nature everywhere. So like if you look at a storm, trees that are very brittle in a, a big storm, the branches, because they're more brittle and dry, they crack, break. And oftentimes here in, in Huntington Beach, when we've had big storms, we have trees that literally have you know, collapsed over. They've like snapped in half. We've had palm trees that have snapped. We've had trees that have snapped. It's a crazy thing to see, and they're big trees. And then the trees that are more flexible and more limber, they just, like a rubber band, they just sprung back up. They may have been touching the ground and, and being threatened to snap, but because they were green and flexible, they survived the storm. And then, yeah, they lost a few leaves and stuff, but they, you know, they'll continue. They've been around for 50 years. They'll be around another 50 years, you know, or another 200 years, or however long the lifespan of that tree is. That, I think, signaled to us as human beings that we need to be flexible of both body and of mind. It takes effort and frankly, it's uncomfortable. And to top it off, ridicule, marginalization, opposition, and denigration from those who cling to what they think they know greet us along the way. Those are the ones who don't want change. They want things to stay as they are. You know, like one of the things that I hear right now in this particular environment that we're living, here we are, you know, March 8, May 18th, uh, 2020 is that uh, they can't wait for things to go back to normal. Well, things aren't going to go back to normal. We are going to create a new normal, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, this is no different than when, when you, you know, if you are a person who's had a child, once you've had a child, things never go back to the way they were normal before you had a child. No, your life will never be the same again. If you were single and you got married, even if you got divorced, you will never go back to normal to what you were pre-single. Even if you become single again, whether it's through divorce, death, what have you, you don't go back to how you were before. No, you create a new normal. And that's what's happening now. We are, we are in a global reset. And this global reset is creating a new normal for everybody, every being. Everything, including the plants, the trees, the animals, everything is being affected at this point in time. And it's really obvious, uh, right time, more than any other time in, in this planet's history. So who, with such an unconventional bent, is willing to meet such adversity in the name of some concept they cannot embrace with their senses, yet which is alive in their minds? How many times in history have individuals who were considered heretics and fools and thus took the abuse of unexceptional emerged as geniuses, saints, or masters. Will you dare to be an original? Think about the first people who challenged the conventional wisdom 
and said, no, the earth is not flat. The earth, in fact, is actually round. Those first people who started disclosing that information, first they were ridiculed, they were laughed at. They thought, you know, you guys are charlatans, you're heretics. How could you possibly say, you guys have lost all sanity. You're, you're nuts, you're insane. Who really was insane? Those resisting change and light of new information? Or those who in light of new and in light of the new information were willing to, with an open mind, accept it, grasp it, and take advantage of it. Because those people who knew that the globe was round knew they couldn't fall off the edge of the earth now. All the others who thought it was flat thought, oh, when you get to that edge of the sea, then you're gonna fall over into outer space or something. So that group is living in fear of the unknown. And now this group over here that has a greater awareness in light of this new knowledge, ah, yes, we realize that there's more that we don't know, but it's sure nice to know this. When you know better, you do better. Change as a choice instead of a reaction. So it seems that human nature is such that we balk at changing until things get really bad. And we're so uncomfortable that we can no longer go on with business as usual. And this is as true for an individual as it is for a society. I wanna pause right here just briefly, just to make a sidebar comment, because one of the things that I've, I've learned throughout my career and over my lifetime is that, you know, each individual has a personality, but make no mistakes. Whether you look at a little group of people, it could be a group of children, it could be a church group, it could be a civic group, it could be a um, charity organization, it could be a business, whatever group of individuals, they have a collective personality as well. And the city that you live in has a, for people in your city, from one city to another city, like Huntington Beach's personality, even though we're right next to Newport Beach, Newport Beach has a different personality than Huntington Beach. Seal Beach has a different personality than Huntington Beach. Venice Beach has a different personality than, and you know, they're all individualized. The, the sum of each one of those individuals that live in those communities make a collective personality. Our country, we are, you know, founded on a, a group of men who were rugged individualists. That was a much different personality than the subjects to the queen where, we, where our forefathers came from. So make no mistakes, groups have a personality as well. And that's what Dr. Joe is talking about here. We wait for crisis, trauma, loss, disease, and tragedy before we get down to looking at who we are, what we're doing, how we're living, what we're feeling, and what we believe or know in order to embrace true change. Often, it takes a worst case scenario for us to begin to make changes that support our health, relationships, career, family, and future. My message is why wait? We can learn and change in a state of pain and suffering, or we can evolve in a state of joy and inspiration. Most embrace the former. So to go with the latter, we just have to make up our minds and change will probably entail a bit of discomfort, some inconvenience, a break from a predictable routine and a period of not knowing. I'm gonna hit the pause button big time here because you know what, no matter what, you're going to have, when you choose to do that introspective work, to take the time to evolve, change, and become a better version of you or not, you are going to suffer discomfort, inconvenience, and a break from a predictable routine and a period of not knowing, not knowing whether you choose to do this work or you choose not to do this work. Either way, you're gonna pay a price. You're gonna go through the pain, you're gonna go through the discomfort. Why not pick the option that gives you a bigger, fuller expression of you where you can experience more love, more joy, more peace, more success, more abundance, more prosperity, more friends, more, more of whatever it is that you want in your life, more creative expression. Why not? But you have the free will to choose or not to choose. If you choose not to choose, if you choose not to choose, by default you choose to have the discomfort, the inconvenience, a break from the predictable routine and a period of not knowing, 
getting what you've always gotten to get what you've got. Or have the discomfort, inconvenience, a break from the predictable routine and a period of not knowing. Ah, but because you're embracing a new way of looking and framing things, you could have an expansion of creativity, of, of, of inspiration, of peace, of health, of wealth, of creativity, of joy, of fun, of laughter, new friends, new people, new societies, new places to live. Who knows? The power is in your choice in either direction. That's the exciting part. So most of us are already familiar with the temporary discomfort of not knowing. We stumbled through our early efforts to read until this skill became second nature. When we first practiced the violin or the drums, our parents wished they could send us to a soundproof room. Pity the hapless patient who has had his blood drawn by a medical student who has had the requisite knowledge but still lacks the finesse that she will gain only through practice. Absorbing knowledge, knowing, and then gaining practical experience by applying what you learned until a particular skill became ingrained in you, knowing how, is probably how you acquired most of your abilities that now feel like a part of your being, knowing this. In much the same way, learning how to change your life involves knowledge and the application of what knowledge is. That is why this book is divided into three overarching sections. Throughout parts one and two, I will build ideas in sequence, forming a bigger, broader model of understanding. So for you to personalize, if some ideas seem repetitive, they are there to remind you about something that I don't want you to forget, that I want you to remember. So repetition reinforces the circuits in your brain and forms more neural connections so that in your weakest hour, you don't talk yourself out of greatness. When you ease into part three of the book with a sound knowledge base, you can experience for yourself the truth of what you learned earlier. Okay, part one, the science of you. Our exploration will start with an overview of philosophical and scientific paradigms related to the latest research about the nature of reality, who you are, why change has been so difficult for so many, and what is possible for you as a human being. Part one will be an easy read, I promise. Chapter one, the quantum you introduces you to a bit of quantum physics, but don't be alarmed. I start there because it is important that you begin to embrace the concept that your subjective mind has an effect on your objective world. The observer effect in quantum physics states that where you direct your attention is where you place your energy. And us, I'm gonna repeat that again because I think this is this is one of the energetic energy 101 principles that you need to really pay close attention to because it's like the foundation of all of this. The observer effect. So where you take your awareness, your consciousness, and what you focus it on, whether you focus your energy on the tip of your finger, like as I'm speaking right now, most of you don't really feel your body parts, but if I tell you right now, pay attention to the tip of your nose, you'll go, oh, a second ago, you didn't feel your nose at all, let alone the tip of your nose, but now you feel the tip of your nose. Some of you might be thinking, oh, it feels a little on the cold side, or maybe it just feels, you know, a little, tingly all of a sudden just because you're thinking about the tip of your nose. So wherever you put your attention, so the energy is now going to that body part and that's why it's a little tingly, that's why it may feel a little cold, whatever the case might be, you're, you know, everybody's sensation is a little bit different. So the observer effect in quantum physics states that where you direct your attention is where you place your energy. As a consequence, you affect the material world, which by the way, is maced, made mostly of energy which by the way is made mostly of energy. If you entertain that idea, even for a moment, you might start focusing on what you want instead of what you don't want. And you might even find yourself thinking if an atom is 99.99999% energy and 0.00001% physical substance, then I'm actually more nothing than something. So why do I keep my attention on that small percentage of the physical world when I am so much more? Is defining my present reality by what I perceive with my senses the biggest limitation I have? 
In chapters two through four, we will look at what it means to change to become greater than the environment, the body and time. Yes, make no mistakes, ladies and gentlemen, friends and gems. I want you to know that you are going to learn to become greater than the environment, your physical body and transcend time. Oh yes, it is magic. So you've probably entertained the idea that your thoughts create your life, but chapter two, overcoming the environment. I discuss how if you allow the outer world to control how you think and feel, your external environment is patterning circuits in your brain to make you think equal to everything familiar to you. The result is that you create more of the same. You hardwire your brain to reflect the problems personal conditions and circumstances in your life. So to change, you must be greater than all the things physical in your life. Highlight that, friends and gems. So to change, you, let's highlight it, you must be greater than all physical, all things physical in your life. Everything you touch, see, sense, smell, taste, all of these things, you have to become greater than all these things. The good news is, that it's not that difficult to do. Everybody, nobody is so special that they can't do this. From a five-year-old to a 105-year-old, everybody can do this and it's exciting because it works. Chapter three, overcoming the body. Continue to look at how we consciously live by a set of memorized behaviors, thoughts, and, re and emotional reactions all running like a computer program behind the scenes of your subconscious awareness. That's why it is not enough to think positive because most of us who we are might reside subconsciously as negativity in the body. By the end of this book, you will know how to enter into the operating system of the subconscious mind and make permanent changes where those programs exist. Chapter four, overcoming time. I hit the pause button here. Page, oh, it says location 281. Instead of giving me the page number, oh, that's funny. Okay, well, it's a different book and Becoming Supernatural gave me the page number at the bottom. So I apologize for not being able to give you the page number, but we are at the portion of the book where it says chapter four, overcoming time. So examines how we either live in the anticipation of future events or repeatedly revisit past memories or both until the body begins to believe it is living in a time other than the present moment. The latest research supports the notion that we have a natural ability to change the brain and the body by thought alone, so that it looks biologically like some future event has already happened. Because you can make thought more real than anything else. You can change who you are from brain cell to gene, given the right understanding. When you learn how to use your attention and access the present, you will enter through the door to the quantum field where all potentials exist. Chapter five, survival versus creation, illustrates the distinction between living in survival and living in creation. Living in survival entails living in stress and functioning as a materialist, believing that the outer world is more real than the inner world. When you are under the gun of the fight or flight nervous system being run by its cocktail of intoxicating chemicals, you are programmed to be concerned only about your body, your physical body, the things or people in your environment and your obsessions with time. Your brain and your body are out of balance. You are living a predictable life. However, when you are truly in the elegant state of creation, you are no body, no thing, no time. You forget about yourself. You become pure consciousness, free from the chains of the identity that needs the outer reality to remember who it thinks it is. Part two, your brain and meditation. In chapter six, three brains, thinking to doing to being. You will embrace the concept that you have three brains that allow you to move from thinking to doing to being even better. When you focus your attention to the exclusion of your environment, your body and time, you can easily move from thinking to being without having to do anything. 
In that state of mind, your brain does not distinguish between what is happening in the outer world of reality and what is happening in the inner world of your mind. Thus, if you can mentally rehearse a desired experience via thought alone, via thought alone, you will experience the emotions of that event before it physically manifested. Now you are moving into a new state of being because your mind and body are working as one. When you begin to feel like some potential future reality is happening to you in the moment that you are focusing on it, you are rewiring your automatic habits, attitudes, and other unwanted subconscious programs. Chapter seven, the gap explores how to break free from the emotions that you've memorized, which have become your personality. I'm gonna pause right there because you are, most of you who are hearing this for the first time, most of you who are reading this at this very moment in time are just now being given a news flash. Yes, you are breaking free from the emotions that you've memorized. Make no mistakes, those emotions you have memorized and those memorized emotions have become what you think is your personality which then becomes your personal reality and how to close the gap between who you really are in your inner private world and how you appear in the outer social world we all reach a certain point when we stop learning and realize that nothing Thing. external can take away those feelings from our past if you can predict the feeling of every experience in your life there is no room for anything new to occur because you are viewing your life from the past instead of the future think about it you're doing a backward reach you're literally your brain actually is going neurologically it reaches backwards spatially that's how the neuroplasticity of the brain works it reaches backward in this direction because it's something in the past that's why you hear people in their language they'll even say oh yeah i put that behind me yeah it's like yeah then that no longer it's no longer an issue for me because i put that i put that behind me a long time ago why because in the brain it's actually filed behind you that's why in some of the different health processes that i do to help people relieve pain physical emotional spiritual psychological pain anywhere that they might experience in their body or if they're trying to manifest more prosperity, abundance, new jobs, new this, new that. I take them through processes neurosomatically and they put the unwanted in the past, retaining the lessons, because sometimes you have resistance to letting things go because your subconscious goes, oh, but there's lessons here that I need to keep. So we have a, I have a method to address that so that you get to have your cake and eat it too. You get to keep the lessons and put in the past, file it away so it's no longer part of your, your present and it's no longer part of your future. So here we are forward casting and now you're recalling a memory that you've put forward in the future and bringing it into your now. This is the juncture point where the soul either breaks free or falls into oblivion. You will learn to liberate your energy in the form of emotions and thus narrow the gap between how you appear and who you are. Ultimately, you will create transparency when how you appear is who you are. You are truly free. Part two concludes with chapter eight, meditation demystifying the mystical and waves of your future in which my purpose is to demystify meditation so that you know what you are doing and why. Discussing the brave wave technology made simple. I show you how, to, how your brain changes electromagnetically when you are focused versus when you are in an aroused state due to stressors in your life. You will learn that the true purpose of meditation is to get beyond the analytical mind and enter into the subconscious mind so that you can make real and permanent changes. If you get up from meditation as the same person who sat down, nothing has happened to you on any level. When you meditate and connect to something greater, you can create and then memorize such coherence between your thoughts and your feelings that nothing in your outer reality 
No thing, no person, no condition at any place or time could move you from that level of energy. Now you are mastering your environment, your body, and time. Part three, stepping toward your new destiny. All of this information in parts one, two is provided in order to equip you with the necessary knowledge so that when you demonstrate and apply this information in part three, which supplies that how to, you will have a direct experience of what you've been taught. Part three is all about applying yourself in actual discipline, a mindful exercise to use in your daily life. It's a step-by-step -step meditation process created so you can actually do something with the theories given to you. By the way, did your mind balk when I mentioned that multi-step process? If so, it's not what you think. Yes, you will learn a sequence of actions, but soon you will experience them as one or two simple steps. After all, you probably perform multiple actions every time you prepare to drive your car. For example, you adjust your seat, you put on your seatbelt, check your mirror, start the car, turn on the headlights, look around, use a turn signal, apply the brake, put the car in drive or reverse, apply pressure to the gas pedal and so on. Ever since you learned to drive, you have executed this procedure easily and automatically. I assure you the same will be true once you learn each step in part three. You may be asking yourself, why do I need to read parts one and two? I'll just jump to part three. I know, I'd probably be thinking the same. I decided to offer the relevant knowledge in the first two parts of the text so that you get to the third section. Nothing will be left to conjecture, dogma, or speculation. When you begin the steps of the meditation, you'll know exactly what you're doing and why. When you comprehend the what and the why, the more you will know and thus, the more you will know how when the time comes. Therefore, you will have more power and intention behind the practical experience of truly changing your mind. By using these steps in part three, you may be more prone to accept your innate ability to change your so-called impossible situations in your life. You might even give yourself permission to entertain potential realities that you never considered prior to your exposure to these new concepts. You might just begin to do the uncommon. That is my aim for you by the time you finish this book. So if you can resist the temptation to jump ahead to part three, I promise that when you get there, you'll be quite empowered by what you learn. So I've seen this approach work throughout the world in a series of three workshops I lead. And when people gain the right knowledge in such a way that they understand it completely and then have the opportunity for effective instruction to apply what they comprehend, then like magic, they can see the fruits of their efforts in the form of changes that serve as feedback in their lives. So part three will give you the meditative skills to change something within your mind and your body and to produce an effect outside of you. Once you can notice what you did inside of you that produced an outcome outside of you, you'll do it again. When a new experience manifests in your life, you'll embrace the energy you feel in the form of an elevated emotion such as empowerment, awe, or immense gratitude. And that energy will drive you to do it again and again and again. Now you are on the path of true evolution. Each meditation step delineated in part three is associated with a piece of meaningful information presented earlier in the book. Because you have cultivated the meaning behind exactly what you're doing, there should be no ambiguity that might cause you to lose your vision. So like many skills you've learned in the beginning, it may take all your conscious effort to stay focused as you learn how to meditate, to evolve your brain. In the process, you must restrain yourself from your typical behaviors and maintain your thoughts on what you are doing without wandering to extraneous stimuli. So your actions are aligned with your intention. Just as you might have experienced, when you first learn to cook Thai food, play golf, dance the salsa, or drive a stick shift, the newness of the endeavor will require you to practice this ability continually, training both mind and body to memorize each step. Remember, most types of instruction are formatted in bite-sized chunks so that the mind and body can begin to work together. So once you get it, 
all the individual steps you kept reviewing merge into one smooth process. The methodical, linear approach seamlessly flows into a holistic, effortless, unified demonstration. This is the point of personal ownership. At times, the effort this takes can be tedious, but if you persist with a certain amount of will and energy and time, you'll enjoy the results. When you know that you know how to do something, you're on your way to mastering it. I am overjoyed to say that many people around the world are already using the knowledge in this book to make demonstrable changes in their lives. It is my sincere passion that you too break the habit of being yourself and create the new life you desire. Let's get started.